This afternoon, everyone, I've got Heidi Myers from the name I'm going to butcher of a great gravel event that's been going five years in Vermont. It's Rasputitsa. How did I do, Heidi? You did awesome. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. I love the state of Vermont. And when you reached out and I looked into your event, it just looked really cool. I always like to start off the podcast by having our guests talk a little bit about what their journey was to becoming a cyclist and discover gravel riding. So we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. Um, So I've worked in the cycling industry for 16 years. Uh, I work my full-time job that feeds my family as I'm marketing strategist for uh, Garno. With that, um, you know, I worked with the co-founder of Rasputitsa there for many years. He was a outside sales rep and uh, it was actually his decision. His name is Anthony Mocha. Um, He wanted to put on some type of event and that was six years ago now when gravel was a lot more new to the scene than anything. So uh, we were pretty inspired by like the El Manzo um, that was the first event that really inspired us. And where was that one? So that is in Minnesota, I believe. Okay. We saw what they were doing online, and, and so we we took a gamble, and we knew nothing about organizing an event or anything like that. Um, so our first event brought like 250 people, um, and the rest of pizza right now, is up, it sells out at 1,500, so... In five years, we've experienced some tremendous growth. That's amazing. Well, tell us about that first event and what the course was like. And gosh, going back six years, we're really talking about, you know, probably a lot of people riding on cross bikes and the early introduction of of uh, disc brakes into gravel bikes. Yeah, definitely. Um, the first event, I mean, I'll be completely honest and transparent. Um, you know, we live in northern Vermont, so many months out of the year, the roads are snow covered. So a lot of people spend a lot of time indoor on trainers, um, or if you're brave enough on fat bikes and and whatnot. Um, so we actually mapped the course during the winter months. Um, and then a few months before the actual race, we got out there and (laughs) we were riding it and we came to this section that the road no longer really was that visible. Um, so I had called Anthony, um, I was on course and I said, Anthony, there is no road. And he's like, what do you mean there's no road? I'm like, it kind of goes into a snowmobile trail and it ends like, and so he looked at the map and what, what he had designed had a class four section of road. And that's a section in new England that is not plowed all winter is not maintained all winter. Um, so there is a road there. Um, it's just, becomes um unnavigatable um in the winter months so at that point we had already released the course and it actually became our biggest our greatest mistake um because we ended up calling that 5k section siberia um so so every year there's a section called siberia um which is just that it's the class four section um and great thing about Vermont is spring in Vermont can be many different things. We've had 70 degree race days um, in spring. We've had, you know, 40 degree race days with snow. So what that, what the race brings each year evolved on its own. Um, You never really know what to expect Um, when racing tire choice really becomes super crucial and um, up to the last minute decisions. So is that Siberia section of the course, is that typically one of those cat, we saying cat five or cat four roads? Class four. Yeah. It's a class four road. And does that just mean like to the riders that it's a little bit of a mystery, what they're going to, what they're going to encounter in that given year, depending on the weather conditions? Yeah. I mean, it typically is a hike and bike. Um, again, it depends on your weapon of choice. So a lot, you know, we have a fat bike category and so those guys are, able to cruise through um but i mean we have some riders like ansel dickey doing it on on road slicks um who's who's you know running through siberia <laughs> and is that part of the course design for you guys that you want to make it a very thoughtful choice for each individual rider as to what their bike of choice is going to look like yeah and i mean those are questions like we refrain from answering because it just depends on what type of rider you are uh, depends on the conditions. Um, 
and it really comes down to the last minute. I mean, the, the weather last year was fine, and then the night before the race, it snowed about two inches. So um, it's really it's really a last minute call and a personal choice, and that that makes it a race. I mean, it makes it a race for everybody, it, you know, regardless on your your level, um, because it really evens the playing field. Yeah, I think that's one of the really fun things about gravel cycling at this moment in time in the sport is just this idea that so many different people will have so many different types of equipment in their garage and can bring so many different weapons of choice to any given event. Right. It just makes it a lot of fun. I think, you know, in the early days of mountain biking, you saw that as well, where there was just a ton of experimentation with equipment and whether it was different types of suspension or, or different types of um, tires. It was all just, who knows what's going to work best. We just got to give it a try. Exactly. So that's great. So over the last five years, you said, obviously the, the race has grown tremendously in size. I mean, a 1500 person gravel event um, in Vermont just seems like a huge event. What's it been like over that journey, scaling up just the organization of the event? Has it become incredibly complicated for you and Anthony to pull off? Do you have a big team involved now? <laughs> uh, we don't have a big team involved. It's still primarily just him and I. I mean, we have some great volunteers and some great sponsors, but I mean, it's really him and I behind the scenes. And I think we've been able to pull it off consistently just because it is. And we, we hone in on every single detail and um we always put rider safety and and rider happiness first and we've really come to know like a lot of our riders like you know 1500 riders lining up no i can't tell you i know them all but i probably know a good 300 of them really well so it's really become like a family event right it's kind of like let's come out of hibernation gravel cycling community and and get back together and celebrate getting out on the roads And the community has been really great too. I mean, this past year we had Ted King and Allison Tedrick and Jeremy Powers and Anthony Clark, um, you know, just to name a few line up and I mean, they're lighting up. It's a mass start. So everybody's lining up together. And um, it was interesting. Jeremy Powers like lined up mid mid field just to, to make it a social, you know, piece for him. Yeah, absolutely. Would you, what would you say from a percentage perspective are the people who are really racing at the front versus people that are just out there for the adventure of it all? Uh, the racers, it's, it's a small crowd. I mean, it's probably less than 100 that are really full throttle out there. Um, and, and we, you know, we respect those guys and they're essential to our race, but we also cater to the people just out there braving the elements and just trying to get through. So we do a lot of quirky things on course. Um, we serve maple syrup in ice shot glasses. Um, so all year long, we, we make shot glasses out of ice and we serve maple syrup in them so the rider can take a shot of maple syrup and then toss the, the glass without any environmental destruction. <laughs> and we, we've done like a wheel of death specialized, um, sponsored this like wheel of death on course last year where it's, you know, you potentially had to like sing a David Bowie song or, or chug a beer, or, um, many crazy things. Quick sidebar. How does one make an ice shot glass? Yeah. So we actually have silicone molds, um, but it, it's an intense process. Like pretty much right after Thanksgiving, we have to start. Um, and we've had to purchase like chest freezers to do this and pull it off because, uh, you know, 1,500 shot glasses is a lot to make out of ice. So, um, yeah, it's every night and every day we're, we're making ice molds. I can only imagine. Well, that will definitely be a special treat during the ride, I'm sure. Going back to what you were saying about the percentage of racers, I think that's, for me, that's one of the things I really enjoy right now about the, the time in which we are in the gravel racing scene is you go and you line up with these well-known ex-pros or current pros and it, you know, they're off the front and you're enjoying your race. And at the end of the day, you're all enjoying a beer afterwards and some food. And there's just a great community around gravel cycling. The community is amazing in all aspects and at all levels. And I, you know, I've been in the cycling industry for a while. And I think, I think in the gravel scene, you see that more than any other segment of cycling. Yeah, I would agree. 
I mean, I know Vermont, for example, has a, a great history in the cyclocross scene, and I imagine some of the gravel scene there draws from it. But gravel seems to have something special in particular about it. Maybe the the length of the events or the the uh, adventure orientation of the courses. I just think people tend to really gel and uh, you know work together as a community to to pull them off and enjoy the day. Yeah, and encourage each other. I mean, we've grown our our women's demographic and our U23 demographic pretty extensively. Um, so for the past few years, like the U23, the, the price to enter is, if not free, very, very minimal just to cover our costs. Um, because, you know, we saw that as a small portion of our demographic and we asked ourselves like, all right, if you were 20, why wouldn't you be doing this race? And the easiest answer was cost. Um, so we've grown that. Uh, demographic hugely and then the the women's so we have um this great really supportive women's community that has their own facebook group page and encourages other women riders and uh we have olympian leah davison's mom um she comes out and she prints the bib list of all the women participating and like she'll cheer for the women by name um so like you know, there's just huge enthusiasm there. Um, and the race itself donates all of its profits to Little Bell as the nonprofit founded by Leah and Saber Davison. Um, so last year we, we cut them a check for uh, $20,000. So going back to the race course itself, I'm, I'm super curious. I've, I've done a little bit of mountain biking in Vermont previously, but uh, tell me a little bit more in detail about what riders would expect the types of roads or climbs or trails are they getting on single track in Vermont or is it more uh, gravel road riding? So it's about, um, I think, you know, I think we can claim it's probably about 90% gravel roads. There's a few paved sec- sections just to transition riders, but it's, so it's 90% gravel. Um, it's really rural remote areas. Uh, there's about, uh, over 4,000 feet of climbing in 40 miles. Um, so it's, it's, there's definitely hills, um, and it's up and down the whole way. And then there's that class four section, uh, which was actually part of, um, mountain bike trails this past year, but sometimes that changes year to year. That's just this really tra- challenging section, which it, it almost ends up looking like a military march through because people are, single file through that section just trying to get through and i mean every year the course changes so we've done a cyclocross finish one year the siberia length has changed it's been 5k one year and one mile one year and has it been the same style bike that's been winning the the fast guys and girl category each year or has it has it varied in terms of what people are showing up with um, I mean, it varies with what people are showing up with for sure. Um, it's typically always a cross bike that's winning. Um, but, you know, we have single speeds, we have tandems, <laughs> we have mountain bikers, <laughs> uh, we have fat bikes, we have roadies, uh, we have cross bikes. So we pretty much run the full gamut. Like if you have a bike and you have the will to do the race, you're in. And I noticed this year you've got a fall event as well. Is that new for this year? Yeah, so it's somewhat new. So the first race we actually ever did was called the Dirty 40, and we did that in 2013. And this is kind of a comeback to that event in a new version. Um, So we changed the name, but um, it's pretty exciting. There's 8,000 feet of climbing, and there's um, 100 miles. So um, it's a, you know, and there's a 50-mile route. So there's two courses. Um, there's camp overnight camping available, um, and specialized in sponsoring this outdoor movie theater at the camp campsite. Um, it's at this really cool historic site in Brownington, Vermont called the old stone house, which was a boarding school built by the first African American college graduate. Um, so it, it's really like back to like Vermont's vintage roots and it's got that kind of feel and, um, it's a little bit inspired by Johnny Cash, and uh, we're working on a zero waste policy for that. 
Um, so every rider, when they cross the finish line, will get a custom pie plate and a custom insulated milk bottle that they can go through the food line with. So there's no paper products being used um, because that's just one thing that we've tried to focus on as we've grown and how can we get stronger. Yeah, I think all these all these little things add up to making the event special and memorable. And you know, yeah, I think the nice thing about you guys been working on this for five six years now is you're developing a reputation that every year people can show up and they're going to have a good time. The flavor will be slightly different, but they know and have trust that you've got it dialed. So if they're looking for a place to travel to race to, I imagine this is a good event to to target. Yeah, definitely. Um, and there's live music at all our events. So last year, it's themed every year. Last year, the theme was David Bowie. Um, for 2019, the theme will be Prince. So you can expect to see some purple. That's great. So, yeah, we actually have a... Last year, we had a David Bowie cover band, which was phenomenal the night before the race. And then... This year, there'll be a Prince cover band. So um, there's like a full concert the thing before. Now, for people coming from outside the region, what's going to be the best way to, to get into that neck of the woods? Yeah, so, I mean, you would probably fly into Burlington, Vermont, or Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, from there, you'd probably have to rent a car. Um, we've worked with bike flights. Um, every year to get, you know, your bikes flown in and arrive safely. And with, there's multiple shops in Eastburg, Vermont, because they're home to Kingdom Trail. So they're really used to the bike culture and the bike traffic. Um, so there's m- multiple bike shops there that can receive your bike and get it, get it all ready for you. Um, but it is a little bit out in the middle of nowhere. So it's like an hour and a half from the airport. Right. So you better be ready for an adventure. Yeah, it's an adventure, for sure. Well, I'm excited about that. I love learning about new events in different part of the, parts of the country. I think that's really going to be a, a fun part of the next few years in gravel riding. It's just using events as a way of discovering new parts of the country and new communities. One thing we know, and it's been obvious talking to you, that you know, if I drop in there or someone from the West Coast drops in there, it's just going to be like the communities we have out here. It's going to be very embracing and fun. And you'll find that the guys and girls that you're going to be riding with, whatever section of the race you're going to be in, and everybody's going to be helpful and fun and have a laugh and, and really looking forward to getting to the finish line and just celebrating the achievement of a good hard day out. Definitely, definitely. And we bought a school bus this past year. So we're actually planning on traveling to like Dirty Kansas and Land Road 100 ourselves. So um, we've, we've renovated an old school bus and uh, set up totally wrapped on the outside with our, our theme. And uh, we're redoing the inside right now as we speak. So that should be our gravel travel machine coming soon. Hopefully it makes it all the way out west to California. I'd love to see it. Yeah, definitely. It reminds me of, uh, I toured on the Norba National mountain bike racing scene uh, in the early days, and a company called Retrotech had a school bus, and I remember thinking that was great. You would see riders just basically hitch a ride to the next Norba National on that bus in an ad hoc fashion. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I can't, for me, it's just, it's so amazing to to remind myself of the, of those days, and I'm so reminded and invigorated in the gravel scene right now from those days. Cause as I said before, it's just, it was so nice being part of the early days of the mountain bike community. And I'm feeling those same sensations, which for me as a, you know, as a father and a husband who struggles to find time to ride my bike as much as I'd like, it's just little things like that to just invigorate me to get out there and get back on my bike and put events on my calendar to get out there and stay fit. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely what cycling should be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate the time, Heidi, today. It was great to get to know you and get to know the event. Hopefully, some of my listeners from around the country can put it on their on their calendars for next year and get out there. I, for one, would be eager to try uh, some of those ice shot glasses with maple syrup in it. It sounds spectacular. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, cheers. 
I love talking to race organizers like Heidi around the country and learning about great events like that in Vermont. I think it's important for all of us gravel riders to think about traveling to different regions because as many people know from the mountain bike world, the terrain can feel a lot different in different parts of the country and it just can be a lot of fun. So that's it for us this week. As always, I'd appreciate it if you could share this episode with one or two of your gravel riding friends. It really helps us grow and spread the word. And if you have a moment, please give us a rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform to help us get discovered. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me a note at craig at thegravelride.bike or find us on Instagram at thegravelride underscore podcast. Until next time, I hope you got a lot of dirt under your wheels. Have an awesome few weeks, and we'll talk to you soon. I, I am fumbling over how to say Rasputisa. Is that anywhere close? <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's pretty close. Um, as far as we know, I mean, neither of us are Russian ourselves or have any Russian lineage, but uh, it's Rasputisa. Okay. Um, and that is... That is mud season um, in Russian. So yeah. It's the time of year when roads become really difficult to navigate. Okay. Say it one more time for me. Rasputita. Rasputitas. All right. I'm going to give it a go and we'll have a laugh if I mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right.